Hello, hello, fantastic technology, who knew? Um, hello, welcome to the uh, late morning session for uh, Data Science Festival. Uh, we've got two talks lined up for you. We've got um, Emma Walker from m &S, who's on the stage now, and after her we have Matthias Lutz from Deliveroo. Uh, just a quick reminder, please, please, please switch your mobile phones and any technology you have to silent. Um, and if you do need a toilet, um, please try and wait uh, until a natural break between the presentations. Um, and there are toilets just on the left-hand side of the room here. So, a little bit about Emma. Uh, Emma has been working at M&S since spring 2019, leading the team responsible for data science and working closely with the Sparks and personalization teams. That sounds interesting. Uh, within the business. Emma's background is astrophysics, and after completing a PhD in Oxford, she worked in Italy and the US as part of supernova survey projects. Wow. Do you speak Italian, by the way? Very badly okay, now. Yeah, me too. Yeah. My wife's Italian, so I'm having to learn. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, round of applause for Emma Walker. Hi everyone, uh, it's very lovely to be here. Um, it's really nice to be getting back to doing in-person conferences. Um, don't know about you, but although I find these days quite overwhelming, it is nice to see so many people who want to talk about data science and get involved in um, seeing what we can do with data. Um, so thanks very much to the festival organizers today. Um, it's been really great working with them uh, in the run-up to this. Uh, so as you've heard, I've been at m and for a while. Um, there's actually a fabulous typo in my bio where it says I started in 2019. I actually started in 2020. It just feels like it's been since 2019, just due to the amount of work and um, energy that the team have put in over the last uh, year and a half. It's been really great to be part of the journey of the team. I've called this talk um, Anything But Ordinary Data Science m and kind of stole anything but ordinary from our clothing and home colleagues. It's the title of their autumn winter uh, campaigns. Uh, you might have seen it in adverts on TV. So um, this is part of the materials that they produce for promotion, only I've slightly edited it um, to make it fit the talk today. Oh. Well, that's, that's a good start. Brilliant. Uh, so uh, this is the, the sort of different areas I'm going to cover today. So we can do a bit of an introduction um, to the team at MS. We've only existed for a couple of years, so just to talk a little bit about uh, how we came to, to be, really. Then um, I can whiz through some of the use cases that we, that we have with data science. So we're roughly divided into two different areas, one uh, working on customer-facing data science and the other using data science to improve our business processes. I can talk a little bit about how we've built our team um, from nothing to the, I think, 25 to 30 people we are today. Honestly, we've got so many new people joining um, that it, I'm struggling to keep track of everyone, um, which is a lovely problem to have. Um, and then finally, just wrap everything up and tell you why I think our team is anything but ordinary. I've got a lot of material and I could um, talk for hours on this, so we just, I'd just like to sort of gauge what everyone here is interested in. Um, so we, just with a show of hands, I'm adding one category to this. So um, firstly, if you are an m and employee and know all of this and are here for moral support, please raise your hand. Thank you very much, that's them. If you have any questions, ask them, don't ask me. Um, if you're new or mid-level data scientist and you wanna learn about the data science, if you could raise your hand. Okay, that actually seems to be most of you, so that is good. Um, are you a manager in data science? Do you want to hear about how we've built our team? Okay, so a few of you as well. And anyone else just here for interest? Awesome. Okay, so I think what I'll try and do is cover a bit more of the data science use cases that we've got and um, spend a bit, bit less time on some of the team building, but feel free to come and talk to me or uh, Mehdi Husseini, who's my boss, um, tell him how much you've enjoyed this talk and then ask him any questions that you have about how we've built the team. So, uh, what do you think of when you think of m and It might be, you know, our clothing stores. Uh, we've been around for 130-something years, got a strong presence on the high street in the UK. Is it m and food? So, uh, showing my age slightly, um, I don't know who remembers these adverts. They came out when I was a student. Uh, this is not just any melt-in-the-middle chocolate pudding. This is an M&S 
melt in the middle chocolate pudding. I was going to put the video, um, but it made me too hungry, so we have gone with the still. Um, you might know about our website, mns.com. Um, this is Castle Donington. It's our main distribution center where all of the orders are dispatched. But what you might not know is that we are in 100 markets globally, either through our own uh, websites, through franchise partners, or through third-party sellers like Zalando that we've got here. And finally, you might know about Percy Pig, uh, one of our biggest brands, uh, Percy Sweets, Percy everything, I think, in the run-up to Christmas. There's an M&S just across the way. I was in there earlier. There's Percy branded anything you could possibly want. So um, that's really exciting, although I have to say I am Team Colin. Um, but what you might not know is that M&S is undergoing a massive transformation. As I said, we've been in business over 130 years. We need to evolve to make ourselves a viable 21st century business and beyond. So there are a huge number of transformation programs going on in the business, one of which is our joint venture with Ocado. So for those of you who are Ocado shoppers, you would have noticed that last year you were able to start buying M&S branded goods in your deliveries. We've got a huge number of stores in the UK, um, some of which are a little old and dilapidated. So there's a huge program going on to transform those stores, to bring them up to a modern standard so that you can get Wi-Fi in there, you can get mobile phone reception, all of these kind of things that just might be useful for our shoppers. The one on the right illustrates Plan A, which is our own internal ethical, sustainable trading uh, team. They're currently running a campaign called Look Behind the Label. We're very proud of our um, sort of supply chain credentials and the work that we do with our suppliers. And that's really encouraging people to understand where their goods come from and what they're buying from us. As part of our modernization, we are thinking much more about how customers want to shop and their omnichannel experience, which is a bit of a business buzzword, but it basically means having joined up journeys. So you might be able to browse online, buy in store, or buy online, and in this case, get advice from experts who um, are our store colleagues. We've got wonderful store colleagues. And if you're buying furniture, if you're buying beauty, I think it's even extending to some aspects of men's suit purchasing now online, you can call one of our colleagues and speak to them because they're the real experts in these products. They can advise you on what it is that you might want to buy, how it might work in, the, in your like, living room, for example. So that's another big initiative that we're working on. And finally, an area close to my heart, being head of data science for loyalty, is the Sparks program. Sparks was relaunched last year. It's our primary vehicle for contacting customers. So this is just a small number of the programs. I think we uh, heard the other day there's about 19 big programs going on in M&S, and that's a lot of work. And um, a couple of years ago, um, our department, Digital and Data, was created. So bringing together the data for the organization, the most digitally focused areas of the organization, under one umbrella and one set of teams who are really capable of driving this transformation forward. And that led to the creation of our central data science team. So um, I think Medi joined just over two years ago now um, with a one person and has grown the team uh, to, as I said, 25 to 30. And we're only scratching the surface, really, of some of the work that we're doing. But a big part of that is not just the data science output itself, but the culture of being data-driven, being digital first, and the focus that that will bring us in the future. So um, to introduce you to the team, uh, this, this attractive, lovely lot of people on, their, um, on a crazy golf night or afternoon um, last month, um, like, th this, is, this is who we are, and um, I'm going to talk about some of the great way that these people have done. Cool. So I mentioned that we um, work in two broad areas. So customer-facing, loyalty being one of them, so the Sparks program, 
the kind of uh, ways we communicate with our customers and the experiences that they have with us at M&S. And then also improving our business processes with data science. So a huge amount of work going on in multiple different areas. So I'm just going to take us through each one of those and give you a flavor of some of the work that we're doing. So I'm starting with loyalty, and I've got to be really careful because when I was practicing this, I talked for ages and then ran out of time for the rest of my talk. So I'm going to try and keep it brief. Um, so Sparks is our loyalty program, um, and a big part of that is the personalization of offers that we give to customers. People really love their offers. Um, it's one of the most important things that we, we give to our, to our Sparks members. And it really shows how well we know them as individuals. And we want it to be a rewarding experience for them. So it's offers on things that you buy regularly. It's not an opportunity for us to acquire you into a new category or to cross-sell you or upsell you on something. It's supposed to be a reward for sharing your data with us and, and being one of our customers. And so we started taking this program over ourselves last year and taking it from a rules-based approach to a data science-driven approach. And as part of that, it really enabled us to build a framework that allowed us to balance this customer focus with business needs because we can't um, really run a loyalty program unless it's running a profit as well and it's beneficial for the business units, clothing and home and food, who are involved. So this is the, the kind of framework that we've come up with. So on the customer uh, side, we've got a redemption probability model. So this tells us how likely you are to redeem an offer should we give it to you. So for me, um, you know, offers on, uh, I don't know, cream cakes seems to be one I get quite regularly, which I think tells you a lot about me. Um, women's wear, things that I don't need. Kids wear, I don't have any kids. Um, so that should be reflected in the redemption probabilities that come out of the model. And then we use a technique to uh, generate uplift models. So we measure this, the uplift by the incremental sales that are driven. So when our customers redeem these offers, they often buy other things as well. Um, and so we measure that um, with an uplift model. These are then put into um, what we call an impact score. We multiply them together, basically. Um, and we can throw that into a linear optimizer. So we've got millions of customers. We've potentially got hundreds of offers on the go at the same time, so this is a very big, big problem. We've also got business constraints. So um, we've got things like the number of offers that you can get, like we can't give everyone offers on everything. Um, and we've only got limited stock at any one time, so we have to balance the business needs as well. So this all is all thrown in the optimizer, and out comes the best allocation that we can then send to the downstream system. So things like the offer wallet, which uh, allows our customers to redeem these offers, and email for personalization. So just to talk a little bit about these uplift models, we're using a technique called a T-learner. So rather than make one model where the uh, treatment value is a categorical flag, we make two models where one is a model for if a customer doesn't get an offer, and the other is for if the customer does get an offer. We can then combine these to get a measure of the uplift. So that's shown here by the Kate, the causal average treatment effect. Um, I've glossed over a lot of the details there, um, but happy to talk a bit more about that. There's a great paper by Uber um, on their causal machine learning approach, and this is kind of the inspiration for, for this kind of model. So before I move on, um, We've partnered up with our Sparks colleagues um, to uh, create something special for everyone here today. So if you haven't already picked up a leaflet that looks like this, come and see us uh, at the store downstairs. We've got loads. Um, you can get five pounds off clothing and home uh, when you uh, scan this and download our app. Um, you can also use the QR code to find our job website if you are in the market for a new job or you want to stay in touch with us and find out about the work that we do. So um, you'll have a week to use this, but you have to scan the QR code by Monday. So um, please sort of act fast to make the most of that. Great. Uh, so now I'm moving on to uh, our one-to-one -one marketing work. And this is about personalizing the way we communicate with our customers. Uh, I don't know about you. Uh, I get a lot of emails from a lot of companies every day. 
and I don't always read them. I don't find them very relevant to me. And so this is about um, really understanding how and when we should contact customers and what content they're really interested in. The team are also working on the automation and creation of a content platform that decides what is the best content and automates all of that. And it's really about driving sustainable growth for the business because the last thing we want is to bombard people with email after email and have them unsubscribe from everything. Much better to be able to send them one or two really good, really rich emails that they are interested in than have them like, remove themselves entirely from our email database. So this is an example of the kind of models that the team have built. So what we've got here, are we are predicting the click rates from an email, so a fairly um, well-known uh, like data science problem. And uh, that's the probabilities on the x-axis. Um, we've got the blue is the clicks covered, red is the opens covered, and then the green are the emails that you send. So I've labeled here about the 70% uh, line on the y-axis, which um, is the, the fraction of emails that get sent. So you can see that, let me find the thing. So if we went to here, oh, the axes haven't come out very well um, on the big screen. But basically, if we were here, so a very low probability threshold, we're still recovering most of the clicks and the opens, but we're sending way less. And that means that we're spamming customers less, basically. Um, so that's a real success from this model. Uh, the final area I want to just briefly touch on is digital experiences. So these, this team are responsible for building a lot of the recommendation systems that we have on our website. Um, so you can see here, this is like a product page. Um, for this uh, lovely shirt. Uh, you get recommenders uh, to style it with, so you know, completing an outfit. You might want some trousers, some fancy shoes, um, or you might want a similar product because this one's not quite right for you. And um, I would really encourage you to check out a talk that was given as part of the virtual sessions. Um, Darren and Mo are both here today as well if you have any more questions about that. Um, but it was called Connecting Customers with Products at m and where they cover the maths behind this in a lot more detail. Cool. So I'm going to move on to talking about our enterprise use cases, give you a bit of a break from listening to my voice. Um, and I've got a video um, that's been created by one of our product teams to uh, non-technically introduce some of our enterprise use cases to the business. So hopefully this will play automatically. Our data product and data science teams work in partnership to help our colleagues make smarter, faster decisions across the value chain using data. Limited insight is available to ensure we have the right amount of stock, leading to too much or not enough in stores to meet customer demand. Targeting stock to where it is most likely to sell is something data science can help us identify. Never missing a sales opportunity or trapping stock and automating the process, freeing up the time of our merchandisers. Our stock is now the perfect fit for the business. Previously, Markdown Sale was focused on stock clearance, with no data-led forecasting capability to guide prices, therefore prone to over- or undercutting prices when considering profitability. Markdown optimization leverages our rich data science to determine the optimal discount for profit automating price recommendations, improving markdown event profitability, and maintaining customer experience. And can be balanced with business rules to balance profitability with wider goals. Two percent of time in store is allocated to exploring sales opportunities. Sales opportunities may relate to stock replenishment or rearranging displays. The Sorry, it will come back in a minute. Great. Our data product and data is manual. Teams cannot easily identify which departments they prioritize their time on. 
intelligent sales pro provides teams with an easy to use tool where using okay um i might have to stop that and move on to the next bit is it coming through okay for for you yeah okay our data product and data level and what actions they could take where using data science, we can pinpoint where stores might be underperforming on sales at a range level and what actions they could take to address. We need to optimize ranges in our stores. Stock point optimization leverages MS data and data science models to identify opportunities for removal of low performing ranges from stores, maintaining our ability to meet customer needs whilst delivering reduction in waste and operational cost. Future opportunities will see us explore how we support areas such as initial price decisions, labor planning, and space allocation as we continue to use data to turbocharge our digital first strategy. That's, that's a deliberate blank screen. Okay, here we go. Hopefully, we'll stay okay for the rest of this talk. Um, so what hopefully you managed to, to take from some of that was some of the, the different enterprise and retail use cases. Um, we've got this quite long product cycle where we go from planning to selling to then a, a sales event. And we're trying to work data science into this whole process. So one of the first areas that we've worked on is allocation. So in the video, the mention about getting the right products into stores. And that was also a subject of what the virtual talk last week. So I won't um, cover that in any more detail. But I just really like this image that kind of shows A, the, the time scale and B, the kind of processes that um, the business goes through and that we're looking to influence as well. So another area um, is markdown. So this is the end of season sale. The product is on sale for roughly three months and then um, becomes available for this markdown phase. So what we've got here is a diagram where we've got time and days along the bottom. And then the orange are sales and the blue is stock. So you can see that once the product goes on sale, we're still bringing in stock. The stock levels are increasing despite the fact that we're actually selling. And then as time goes on, um, we reach a point where we make a first cut in price. So in this case, just 20%. You can see that the customer demand like, really responds to that increase as the sales go up immediately after the, the price slashing. We then make two further depths, of, uh, two further cuts to the price. You can see that customers really like the fact that the price is you know, half price. And then the stock levels are dwindling down until we've got virtually nothing left at the end of the season, which is ideal. So how are we going about using data science in this? Well, we're looking into influencing the levels of discount. And we do that using two models. So uh, a forecasting model, which tells us basically what kind of sales we could expect at each level of discount. And then with um, sort of business constraints, we put this into an optimization model to really understand what the best level of discount at any time should be. And uh, we've been using this for the last year or so for all of our sales, um, and it's performing really well. So looking at a use case for foods, um, so this is called stocking point optimization. I didn't really know what a stocking point uh, was until this kind of started, but it's basically a combination of store and product. That's a stocking point. And what we want to do, particularly in our chilled goods, is minimize the wastage that we get. So you don't want stuff you know, just sitting on the shelves going out of date. Um, and so how do we optimize what we send to these stores? So we've looked at how we can refine the planograms that stores receive. So this is telling them what to put where on the shelves. And obviously, it's not just as simple as that. We need to understand customer needs. So if we take something away, in the video it was broccoli. I don't know if you managed to catch that bit. Um, like if we take broccoli away at some higher price, some higher weights, what happens then to the demand of the lowest weight of broccoli? So all of this is quite a complex system. Um, so what you will have uh, heard mentioned in the talk last week was a product feature repository for clothing and home. 
we have one that's very similar for food, where we take all of the information that we have on our food products. So customer baskets, the categorical text, numerical data that we have, even as far as the ingredients. And we can use that to create both similar products and complements. So similar products are ones like broccoli at 200 grams, broccoli at 500 grams. And complements are things that you might buy together. So strawberries and cream is a nice example of that. And that allows us to create a demand model. So if we were going to remove something, how it affects the other products. And so we put this into an optimization and out comes some recommendations that we can send to uh, stores to change how they might range the stores. So again, this is something that we've had in test and is now being moved into production by um, the teams in food. Finally, the one that uh, wasn't displaying particularly well is our intelligent sales probe. So this is something that is for our store managers. They are incredibly busy, hardworking people. And one of the things that they don't necessarily have as much time to do is look at their own store data and work out where they might be missing out. And so we do time series forecasting that allows us to look for anomalies in sales at an individual store level. So it might be, oh, you know, you haven't sold as many gloves as we would have expected this week. Is there a problem? And it could be that the stock hasn't arrived. Fair enough. There's not much the manager can do about that. But it could be that the stock's arrived and it's sitting in the stock room waiting to be put on the shop floor. And so we can highlight to the manager and say, actually, you're missing out on a lot of uh, sales here. How? And they can then get our colleagues to put them onto the shelves. So um, this, these are a couple of screenshots of what that app looks like for the store manager. So trying to make it as easy for them to interpret as possible and also kind of advise us and for us to get feedback on how it's performing. So none of this would be possible without access to our data. So here we've got uh, sort of the data universe that we work in. Uh, we're very lucky to have a data team with data engineers and platform people who are really centralizing all of the data within MS. Uh, we have about 800 terabytes of data. That's the latest figure I've heard bandied around. That is an absolutely huge amount. Um, and so it's all being brought centrally so that we as data scientists, but also our analyst colleagues can access this and use it to understand the business better. So just to give you a flavor of some of the tools that we're using, uh, shout out to Databricks, who are actually downstairs. Next to us, we're using Azure Machine Learning. Uh, we're working, we work very closely with Microsoft, so we're in the Azure cloud. Uh, we're using Python uh, quite a lot for our work and uh, sort of coordinating all of that with ADF pipelines. So I've got a few minutes just to touch on some of, some of these other topics which might be of interest to the managers. So um, how have we built our team? Like, how do you create a culture? And how do you like, both show impact for data science quickly in a business and then also grow your data scientists as individuals so they don't up and leave you? Um, and so unsurprisingly, we've taken a data-driven approach to that. We've adopted um, our own version of the Spotify health check model which are used by their engineering teams. They've got a great uh, blog post on it, which I'd urge you to check out. And so we um, score ourselves regularly on how we're doing as a team. One of the areas um, that we saw that we really needed some improvement on, for example, was uh, the career progression of our teams, um, which was fair enough. We hadn't really got around to doing that yet after the team had started. And so that was our immediate focus. And over the, the course of a couple of months, we build a competency framework for all of the technical skills that we expect our data scientists to uh, demonstrate as they grow from new data scientists all the way up to, well, my level. We're also very conscious of the fact that we can't work in isolation. Um, a lot of us are working in cross-functional teams or even mission teams where we work closely with data engineers, with data analysts, we've got um, product managers, we've got subject matter expertise from the other areas of business, and also, which is really key to this, the business stakeholders who sponsor our work. So that allows us to 
make the most of our colleagues in terms of their expertise and their knowledge. We've got people who've been working for M&S for literally decades, uh, and they, they know a whole lot about the business that we couldn't possibly compete with. So it's really important for us to learn from them and gain their knowledge. Recruitment, obviously that's another huge part of um, the work that we do. Um, what we've done is try and make it as scalable as possible. So uh, we've got one process, but we recruit as a team. So anyone can help hiring, with hiring. Um, and so this has allowed us to be really flexible and uh, recruit for the many open roles that we've had. We also kind of support and train each other on this single process so that uh, when people end up doing interviews, it's not um, an uncomfortable experience for a new person. And finally, one thing that um, M&S is really passionate about is inclusion and diversity. And we've tried to reflect that in our recruitment process as well. So one of the things that um, I really uh, think is important is that we don't ask people to do take-home tests. Like, I don't know about the rest of you, uh, one company tried to ask me to do a six-hour test one weekend. I was like, I'm out, like, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I've got better things to do with my life. Um, and so I, I think, you know, we have to do the same thing. We don't know what other commitments people have outside of the workday. They might have families, they might be carers. And asking them to take time away from that to do a test for us um, seems unfair, and it doesn't necessarily mean that we'll get a diverse team. And so we do all of our technicals as part of our face-to-face -face interviews. And it seems to be successful. We've um, hired some really excellent people, um, who you can, some of whom you can meet today. So that's why I think our team is anything but ordinary. I think um, we're not just any data science team. We've been building a great culture, uh, not just advocating for data science, but for ourselves. And our team are directly able to influence the day-to-day um, -day within our team. So looking to the future, um, we're not going away. m and it needs data science, and it needs data scientists. We're barely scratching the surface of the hundreds and hundreds of possible use cases within the business, and we're looking more and more to work with different parts of the business where they may not have uh, worked with us before. And we really excite, well, I'm excited, I hope that the rest of the team is excited to be seeing our work contribute to the data, to the m and of the future. Um, because it's one of the brands that this country loves the most. So hopefully, if I've galvanized you into action, we're hiring. So um, this QR code takes you to our job website. It's also on the leaflets I mentioned earlier. Please come downstairs and talk to us. We are next to the Data Idols coffee area. Um, and with that, I'm kind of happy to take Q&A. Round of applause for Emma, please. Thank you. It's funny how QR codes have made a comeback in the last 18 months. I wonder why that is. Um, so, questions. Uh, as you know, we're not passing a mic round, so I will, if you have a question, please raise your hand, and I will do my best to relay your question for the benefit of the room, the speaker, and the video. So, does anyone have a question they would like to ask? Yes, young lady over here. Very interesting talk. I have a very specific question about the loyalty um, program that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. A question about the loyalty program? Sorry. So I can, I can just about hear. But it's more for the benefit of the rest of the room. Oh, right, yeah, the, good point. The video. Sorry, everyone. So you mentioned that there's some optimization um, model. There's an optimization model. At the core of the whole thing. At the core of the whole thing. Uh, so for people who didn't hear, it's a little bit about the process that we go through when we're allocating offers to customers uh, in our loyalty scheme. Uh, so thank you, that's a really great question and it's something that we've um, been looking into and we've been experimenting with. So um, 
I hope you've all managed to take a picture of this QR code. Let me just go back to my um, flow diagram earlier. So the customer portion is measured by the redemption probability, so how interested you are in, in those products. And that's based on all of our transactional data that we have about you. Um, and then the uplift is the incremental sales. We combine them together. We can dial those up or dial them down. So if we wanted to run something that was entirely focused on customers, we, would, we could just allocate based on how likely you are to redeem. So you might get the best offers for you. Um, if we're more concerned about efficient trade, we can dial up the um, incremental sales slightly as well. So we did run some experiments on that earlier this year. Um, this method with the one-to-one -one seems to actually be at the sweet spot. Surprisingly enough, we sort of got there with our first, first go. Um, but we can, uh, yeah, we can sort of look at those. And also, we can give customers different offers. So we might be able to give you two based on your redemption and then two based on the combination of redemption and sales. So that allows us to really um, optimize uh, based on what our colleagues are after as well in the trading teams. So um, that's kind of how we do that. Has that answered your question? Awesome. Okay. Also, Emma, actually, it works a lot better if you just relay the question back before you answer it for the next okay. time. Okay. Yeah, I can do that. Uh, any other questions? They're always at the back, aren't they? <laughs> okay. You're going to have to yell. <laughs> Yeah, so I think those are two sort of slightly separate questions. So it's about how we attract candidates and how we get them to stay. So the first one is a lot of our um, recruitment is organic recruitment. So it's people who come to us. So you know, if m and is an, an employer that you might want to work with, don't wait for a recruiter to come and contact you. Like, contact us um, because we've always got, we've, well, since I started, we've always been hiring. And so there are, there are roles available at most levels within the team. How do we keep people? That's part of the culture work that we're trying to do. So ensuring that we are giving people the work that they're interested in doing. And then also uh, building something that's not just the work. So ensuring that people have done, you know, have met each other. Like a lot of us joined the company in lockdown. We might have even interviewed re everyone remotely. So they've never even set foot in the office let alone met people in three dimensions. So ensuring that the teams get to spend time with each other, get to know each other both on a personal level but also on an expertise level. Uh, we also um, kind of do things like uh, time for innovation or learning and giving people the right tools for that so that um, you can grow as a data scientist whilst you're working for us as well. Um, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, so um, I hope everyone heard that because I did, but it's about MS. MS is an old company. Has there been any resistance to data science and change? Um, the short answer is yes, um, but we're now demonstrating the value that we can bring, and that's the best evidence um, of the work that data science can help with. The other thing is, what I haven't mentioned is um, we have a great team who are doing a wonderful job of educating and upskilling the rest of the business around data and around digital. So they're running um, training sessions on you, know, how to use Excel, how to use Power BI, which is our dashboarding tool, so that people who are not necessarily able to write an SQL statement and get data out of the database can still use the information that they're presented with and that they're also aware of digital and data. Like, There's no excuse now for any colleague not to have the app, not to be able to help a customer install the app in store so that they can have a, a digital experience as well. So uh, we have a whole team who have strategists and this academy program that's involved in upskilling everyone in the business, not just us in the support center, but the 
60 odd thousand people that work in MS as a whole. Um, and the leadership team are just as, as important in that as um, you know, someone who is um, doing your scanning of your shop in a store. Okay, cool. Any more questions for Emma? Okay, last question, lady at the side. If you can yell it and then Emma can relay the questions. Yeah. Yes, so the question was about upskilling our own sort of data practitioners as well. Um, yes, um, so let me actually just go to this data diagram that we have. Where's it gone? So on here, you can see that there are a number of different roles mentioned. Data scientists at the top obviously being the most important. Um, but we've also got um, data engineers working here. We've got analysts. Analysts up here, so a lot of our analytics teams actually use Databricks for, for SQL. And Python, we've got analysts working over here in more of a guided self-serve kind of way with the dashboarding. Um, they all have their own learning paths with the academy as well. And uh, one of the perks of being in the data science team is we also have Coursera subscriptions for all of our data scientists. So a lot of them are doing um, courses from... Uh, at the MLOps course that um, is fairly new on there from deeplearning.ai. I think that's been fairly popular. I'm looking at blank faces, but please, yeah, nod. They're nodding. Um, so, you know, there, there's, there's different things for everyone depending on their level. Okay, Emma, thank you very much. It was an amazing talk. Thank you. Can we get a round of applause for Emma?